Well, first off, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I uh, really appreciate this final slot. So you guys are all really, uh, really excited and in tune to see me. It's like, oh yeah, that's great. Can't wait to hang around for this guy from the Seawolves, whatever the heck that is. Just in case, by the way, just in case you're wondering, we are Seawolves that play nowhere near the ocean. Just saying that. Uh, so we don't know geography. Okay, well, uh, let's go here. That's Jarriott Park. That's beautiful Jarriott Park, 10 blocks from Lake Erie. And uh, so we're going to get started here with hopefully something here. Okay, now uh, just to kind of keep things light from the outset, you know, we all do things to bring people to the ballpark, bring people to the arena. Uh, and I've done a few interesting things over my 19 year career to do that. It's all 19 years in minor league baseball. So we're going to play a fun little game and it's called, which of these things have I not done to bring people to the ballpark? <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna start with the first one. Kiss a pig. All right, that's, that's, that seems pretty basic. Let's see. Uh, run 500 times around the bases. Well, that's, that's a little bit more aggressive. This thing, take me out to the ball game while receiving a prostate exam in front of 5,000 people. And D, giving a speech to a Rotary Club from behind the bar in Outback Steakhouse. All right, by show of hands, which of these have I not done? Let's see, A, what do you guys think? A, B? B, all right, C, C, and D. All right, okay, and the answer is kiss a pig. All right, I have run 500 uh, laps around the bases. It's um, 34 miles, in case you're wondering, uh, and it's not easy. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, the Outback Steakhouse thing, absolutely true. I showed up to speak to seven people. That was fantastic. Uh, I did make a sale, which was great. Uh, uh, now, this is a little disingenuous. I did participate in a fundraiser to try to kiss a pig, and unfortunately, I got into a situation where uh, I was going up against some pretty stiff competition. Only the top fundraiser uh, could, um, could kiss the pig, and I did sell tickets as part of that campaign. I, I finished out of the running. The, uh, the person who finished first actually was Brett Favre's brother, so a little nugget for whatever that's worth. Uh, so, um, you know, so, so be it. So there's the pig, in case you're wondering. Want to show that. Also, I uh, want to let you know that the pig, uh, even though I didn't get a chance to kiss the pig, was more gentle than my proctologist. Uh, so, yes, that is red hot, in case you're wondering there. If you guys want more details on that, I'm happy to tell you later. So, so the story is we, there was something called the two knuckle challenge that passed around from different GMs in minor league baseball. And it was about prostate cancer awareness. And we wanted to bring people out to the ballpark, encourage them to have prostate exams if they met certain uh, factors. If they're over the age of 40 or in some cases over the age of 50, depending on race and, and whatnot. And so it, it was just something that we kind of passed on from GM to GM. And uh, I, I got mine uh, and uh, it was... It was, it was a story. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but yeah, so that, uh, we sold some tickets at night as well, just for folks could see me uh, debased in public. So uh, in any case, uh, I, I realize I'm the last, last guy keeping you from PNC Park, so we're going to try to uh, keep, keep going here and try to keep things a little, little light. Um, I'm with the, the Erie Seawolves, AA affiliate of the Detroit Tigers, uh, two hours north of here. And... Uh, I guess from, from our standpoint, we are a little bit of a reclamation project, uh, meaning that you know, we have been gone through a little bit of a distressed market. First off, the market is already a small market uh, by, by even minor league baseball standards. Uh, and I went through a uh, couple of ownership changes over a period of time where people tried to move the team. And so we had to be um, you know, basically caretakers of the franchise, rebuild the, the reputation, and kind of restore some of the integrity back into the, to the franchise. I'm happy to say that that last year we won something uh, that's uh, very important to the team. Uh, the local newspaper gave out something called the Commitment to Erie Award uh, for, uh, for work you do in the community, and we actually were named the, uh, the recipient of that. And if you'd have told anybody five years earlier that this franchise would have a commitment to the Erie community, uh, they, they probably would have laughed at you. So, uh, so any case, um, you know, in, in, in coming here today, we wanted to talk about some different tactics, in the, and we, we use some, some tactics for, uh, with the ball team, but before coming here, I, I reached out to my, my brethren in minor league baseball and asked them their opinions on you know, what, what sales tactics would you share to this room of people. And while I don't think all of these are what I'd consider to be tried and true uh, tactics, uh, I think they reinforce probably a lot of things you heard here today, so I thought it was, was very much worth sharing. Uh, tech is great, but you need to be in front of people. All right, so we're going to play a little drinking game at PNC Park tonight. Anytime somebody says enter, uh, experience or relationships, you take a drink. 
we're going to be hammered in five minutes, right? Uh, so, so, we've got, uh, so we've got that. So it all starts with relationships. Take your first drink. Uh, have your own business plan. We were just talking about this. Uh, I think this is um, a fantastic recommendation there. Learn from as many people as you can find. Find out what works for you and perfect it. Okay, that's a pretty sound reason. Uh, every transaction is an exchange of information. Use it. Think about this. Uh, I'm actually going to mention a, a book here. It's, uh, uh, I'm not being paid for this or anything. There's a book called The Experience Economy. It's written by Joe Pine uh, and Jim Gilmore. Uh, the book is, uh, it's, boy, it's, it's more than a decade old, but it's been updated with new examples. So instead of talking about things like America Online, it's talking about uh, things like Snapchat and whatnot. So, uh, but the fact is, is that there's an exchange of information. Every time you interact with a customer, how can you get that? How can you use it? How can you turn it into revenue? So have a plan to be able to do that. So I thought that was a pretty good insight. Okay. Stand out with a handwritten thank you note. The exact opposite. Let's go low tech in order to make yourself stand out from the crowd. Urgency through, through deadlines. I, I thought a, a recent tactic I thought was pretty interesting, interesting was the um, uh, West Michigan Whitecaps, uh, another minor league baseball team. Uh, they, they do something with their groups where they uh, have a lottery for dates. They ask each of their renewing, uh, renewing clients to basically send them three dates with a deposit, and basically they have a lottery to pick who gets the best dates on the schedule. So depending on what your demand situation is, that might get those deposits in earlier, get people signed up earlier, and, and those folks might you know, get the dates for that premium inventory. So once again, it depends on your individual situation, but use deadlines to create urgency. Create a touch plan for dormant accounts. So what's a dormant account? Anybody that's not doing business with you right now, how are you gonna stay in touch with them? Everybody has somebody they wanna do business with and hopefully a long list of those folks that you can hopefully convert in the future, but what are you doing? It's not just a uh, you know, one call once a year, hey, do you wanna buy tickets? No, it's you're reaching out to them. If there's information that's relevant to, to that organization, you do that. You might send them a giveaway item once a year. You might plan a budget to be able to do this, but making sure that you have a touch plan for those companies that are currently not customers of yours, but hopefully can be in the future. All right. Do your homework and speak their language. I think it's pretty straightforward. Mine your stadium arena for experiences and leverage them every chance you get. Uh, talked a lot about experiences today. Once again, you can take a drink. Uh, but I think, this is, I think this is spot on. I know we're doing this more and more, trying to identify opportunities for us to be able to take something uh, that we can connect with people over, that they can remember. It's, it's making memories in minor league baseball and turning that into a sale. Is, is there something that we're not doing today that if we kind of put a label on it and monetize it, that we can actually turn it into a, uh, a bigger ticket sale? So examples might be in our, in our industry, you know, having somebody accompany the manager to take out the lineup card, the opportunity to watch fireworks from the dugout after the game. These are things that just, we're talking about an ROI standpoint, they just don't cost anything, but they're, they're something that's memorable, they bring people back and helps us make money. Or you can sign LeBron James, that's another way to be able to, uh, uh, in order to be able to uh, sell more tickets. Okay, so uh, on the um, topic of sellouts, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, uh, philosophy that, that we have, uh, our, our old ownership group, uh, Mandalay Baseball Properties, you may be familiar with them, you may not, they, they don't exist in their same form anymore. There used to be uh, five teams that were under the umbrella, and, and we were one of the five teams. We were the runt of the litter, uh, and, but it was still great to be a part of it. Uh, some of the philosophies are very appropriate for some of the markets, some of them don't necessarily work in all of the markets. Uh, Tremendous sellout streak in, in, in Dayton, Ohio, where they have over a thousand consecutive sellouts. Uh, really impressive, longest in professional sports in the US. Um, so, do a nice job of that. But we have had the, um, the challenge of trying to you know, kind of build this thing back up, as I previously mentioned. And so, from, from our standpoint, uh, we, we don't have LeBron James. We don't have the star power. We don't have necessarily even the, the, the place. And when I say the place, you know, we don't have the HD video board. We have a nice video board, but we don't have the HD. We don't have some of the amenities that you have at the major league level. So what are we going to do to be able to, to do this? Well, we're going to have a good strategy, uh, and that strategy is going to involve really two things. One, we're going to have a great experience. Um, take another drink. And we are going to, uh, we're going to tap into passions and interests that people have. Uh, we're going to look for those, uh, no matter... 
Um, how narrow the silo, if, it, if we think that it has the ability to sell tickets, that's really where our focus is going to be. So instead of focusing on star power in place, we're focusing on, uh, we're focusing on experience and interests. So from, uh, from, from, from our standpoint, uh, we are going to focus on four particular strategies that we have, four, four tactics. Some of this is not revolutionary, but I'll tell you how it, it plays out with regards to us. So, for instance, using added value to sell ticket packages. You heard people all day talk about different ways to be able to do this, whether it's membership models, uh, whether it is uh, uh, tiers, or if you, for us, it happens to be something that is uh, uh, part of this kind of sellout strategy. We're going to use food as part of our motivation to get people to buy. We want to create an excellent experience, an excellent value. By the way, I realize that doesn't work for everybody. But uh, we're going to sell uh, more than a third of our tickets through packages. And the lion's share of those are going to be through smaller packages. They're going to be 7 to 17 games. But these folks are going to get something every time they buy one of these packages. And it basically involves their meal coming out to each game. Now, that might seem a little bit outlandish or what the cost is going to be. And once again, I sit here and tell you it doesn't work necessarily at every single market because you might not control your own concessions. But we're going to try to find ways to basically make it too good a deal for people not to buy their tickets in advance. We want them buying more. We want them buying earlier. So we're going to focus our efforts to make sure that we can encourage behaviors that do that. Okay. We then are going to, uh, we're going to go groups for sellouts. Now, Part of this is how we structure our schedule. So when we start our year, every single year, we identify the best dates that are on the schedule. We pick 22 for us, uh, but it's different for all markets. We pick the absolute best dates that we think have the best chance of selling out. Because the idea behind the sellout mentality is that the ballpark is just a much better place to be when you have a capacity crowd. It's going to be, it's going to be a buzz. It's going to, you're basically, people are going to be talking. It's going to change your behavior. If you walk up and you can't get a seat, you're going to tell somebody about that. You might not be necessarily happy, and there's some service things that go along with that, but you want to make sure that that environment, that sold out capacity crowd is something that's noteworthy. So what we're going to do, once again, we're going to pick those dates that make the most sense for us, and we are going to tier our group strategy around those particular dates. Uh, and so uh, you know, we had, a, we had a, a date recently where we had, a, oh boy, I think probably about seven different levels of different things, and, and not all of them were group strategies. We gave away a motorcycle before the game. Uh, we had uh, mascot mania. Once again, those are a couple of promotions, but we had layers upon layers where all the, all the group outing areas in the ballpark were sold out, and that place was buzzing. It was a great place to be, and the person that walked up that couldn't get the individual ticket on that night is going to do something a little bit different next time. So we're going to focus on those core dates for us, and we're also going to acknowledge that, look, hey, on some nights at the ballpark, that ballpark may look a little better than we'd like it to be. You know? However, from our standpoint, if we go and we put all of that same energy, that same effort into a Tuesday night in April, which for us is not peak season, just in case you're wondering, and put that same effort to getting 200 people, if we apply the same exact effort to our Saturday in early June, we're going to get 1,000 people. So if we're going to put out the same effort, then why not get the full result? Okay. And then for us, we focus on what those peak dates are going to be. And uh, it almost seems a little sacrilegious, but we're not going to worry about April until we've sold out May through August. That's just part of our strategy. Um, so, so we're going to do that and keep doing But groups is a key piece for us. And um, we talked about groups and all kinds of things all day. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because you've heard a lot of talk about it today. Uh, we are going to create one amazing single game offer. Uh, we do not believe in putting buy one, get ones in the penny saver, putting them all over the place. We are going to limit the number of discounts. We've weeded out almost all the different things that we could do. And we're basically going to line ourselves behind one really good strategy and a strategy that just does not compete or discourage people from buying season tickets, half season tickets, the things that we want people to be buying. So we're going to create something that we can layer onto those dates. We're going to do it one time per month, and it's going to appeal to the value buyer. For us, this amazing single game offer is what we call our McDonald's friends and family program. So for us, you, we, we go out to McDonald's, and by the way, different teams have this, and they go out and they, they partner with different restaurants. Some people do pizza joints. Some people do 
Arby's, whatever it might be. Ours happens to be McDonald's, and you can do it two different ways. You can basically work out an agreement with them where basically uh, they will get exposure in all the advertising that you might be doing for this, and it depends on your own market what the advertising is going to be in exchange for the number of meal vouchers that you need to be able to imp implement it. Or you can flip it around and you can do a paid sponsorship uh, and then pay them upon redemption on the actual um, vouchers. So it works both ways. We actually have part cash sponsorship and then we get the, the food vouchers for free. So every, every, you know, folk, every, I'm sorry, every uh, restaurant you work with is gonna be a little bit different. But basically we have four mm -hmm. tickets to the game. We have four McDonald's value meals. We have four Seawolves caps. These caps look good. They are, they are a replica style cap, and we buy them in bulk, and we get them from overseas, and we place our order in September, and we get them for a little over a dollar a piece. And so we do that whole entire thing, and we do it for $32. Now, maybe we could do it for 36, maybe we could do it for 40. I've seen it done by some teams with, uh, at the AAA level at a higher price point, but for us, we decided that 32 is where that piece is gonna be. Uh, and then we put resources behind it in order to be able to do that. It's the only single game offer we're really putting resources behind in terms of, in terms of, of advertising. You put it out there, and it's a good deal, right? I mean, the tickets alone are basically that price, right? So now, but now you're going to get food. Yes, there's no McDonald's at the ballpark, so it's a redeemed separately. You need to clarify that. We also require that they purchase it in advance. You're not walking up on game night and getting this offer. So individual teams have whatever their cutoff is, but we are, if you walk up on that night, sorry guys, it's not there. This is an advanced purchase offer. And by the way, we limit it to 254 packs per date, which means that when they're out, they're out. And you gotta wait next month for that special offer to be there. But that's really the key thing that we do. We don't, we don't run a, a buy one, get one out every single time and have our uh, season ticket holders wonder why they're season ticket holders. Interesting story tied to that. We have a woman who's a season ticket holder now uh, her name's Anne Marie. Uh, that's inconsequential, but Megan knows who she is. Um, and so she's a season ticket holder with us. She did not used to be a season ticket holder because one of the things the team used to do is if you went to Wendy's and you upgraded from a soft drink to milk, then you got two free tickets to come to a game. She did that a few times. She didn't need to buy season tickets, and she had stronger bones for it too. So, um, but. It's just we were undercutting ourselves in the market and it just doesn't make sense. Uh, so we reel all that back in, we do one game per month for the value buyer, uh, and we sell the heck out of it. Uh, the last, uh, last thing that we focus on is home field advantage, which is, it's been mentioned in a few different ways, uh, a few different times today. Um, if you can sell at the ballpark, sell at the ballpark. If you sell at the arena, sell at the arena. I realize this, this is logical, but sometimes we get into the grind and we think about the convenience of our customer and we don't always necessarily go out, or where we go out and see them and we should be bringing them to us somehow. Uh, sales are made on emotion and, the, and to be able to be out there and experience it and feel it and see it, you just, you really can't replicate it. Uh, I've got a, a two stories for you that tie to this. Uh, I, I worked in uh, Trenton, New Jersey with the Trenton Thunder. Erin Lee in the back back there, she did too. Uh, and we had, a, we had an open house out at the ballpark. These were people that were largely cold calls but were in industries that we felt made sense to be a part of us. We gave them an invitation to come out to an open house at the ballpark. Uh, I think we invited uh, roughly about 50 companies. I think about eight took us up on it. All right? It was very obviously an open house to come see it. Uh, we came, we, we showed them around, we gave them the, the quick tour, we were very respectful of their time, we gave them a little something to eat. Out of that, we got, uh, we got eight season ticket holders and we also got somebody who bought an outfield sign, they bought it for a three year contract on the spot and they are still with them today. And that was, I think, 2007 when we did it. I said we got a return on our investment for that. Um, so, so that's one example of using home field advantage. Uh, the second is uh, something I, I blogged about or you know, wrote a post for, for Troy recently uh, where we had somebody who was an, an auto body shop uh, owner. He uh, actually had been, had been with us uh, and had gone away for a few years, knew what we did, but worked through an ad agency. And that's an entirely different conversation for a different day. But uh, worked through an ad agency and so uh, we never really had the relationship with him that we wanted to have. Uh, until we had an opportunity to go through a seminar, we saw he was uh, gonna be there, and we actually signed up for the seminar almost exclusively for the opportunity to spend more time with him. And lo and behold, we spent that time, and during the conversations in the seminar, uh, well, 
you know, he came to realize that, well, maybe we didn't necessarily understand everything we bought the first time around, and maybe we could take a look at this. So uh, we knew the stage was set to have a meeting. We had that meeting, and, but we had it at his place. He had three people. We wanted it to be convenient, and sat down and had a little discussion, and it was a good, healthy discussion, but we just, he, he hadn't bought yet. He hadn't bought, despite the fact that we had a chance to get to know him, uh, despite the fact that we you know, put, put on the table some pretty good ideas. Uh, so then I made the suggestion, well, you know what, guys, I'm not sure what you're doing this afternoon, but why don't you come on out to the stadium? Right? I mean, go grab lunch, or you know, if you want to, we can go to lunch. Uh, but come, come on out to the stadium that afternoon. They agreed to it. The three of them came out, and I'm telling you, within three minutes of being out there, he was back at a sponsor and was spending uh, five figures a year, which, I mean, we are... We, we live in five-figure land. We're not in six-figure land for most of our partnerships. Uh, but for a local auto body shop to spend that amount and basically do it largely because he could get out there and all of a sudden sense what we had talked about, that sense, that feeling, he could picture himself there. I could say it all day long, but without you know, him being in that space, I'm not sure we would have gotten that sale. You know, so five figures for us and multiple years just because we did it largely at the ballpark. So. So those are, those are four strategies for us. We want to use uh, the tools that are available to us to help us sell ticket packages. For us, uh, it is uh, food and beverage that we use, uh, groups for sellouts by stacking them on uh, peak dates, one amazing single game offer, and home field advantage using it for selling. So once again, I realize that we are at the end of the day here. You guys want to get results, and the result you want to get right now is getting to PNC Park. So that's where I stop talking. If you have some questions, I'd be happy to, to address it for you. But if not, and you guys want to go drink, uh, I'll say experience the first time. <laughs> so when, you, when you're stacking, you're stacking them for peak dates? When you stack, when you stack those games or pick those games that you're going to go after groups? We do. We do. Now, we, you can make the argument that we might have been at 70% on that day already, but we'd rather make sure that we're at 100%. But yes, we do, we do do it on peak. So is that based off of date or based off of historical data that you guys have on what dates that you're going to pick? Yes and yes. Okay. So, so yes, we have, we have good historical data. It goes back uh, 10 years. And we know that the first Saturday in July is going to do this when we're home. So we absolutely do that. We also we work around some things that we know that are in the schedule that might be um, trouble spots or things that we want to avoid. And so while we might have good, good historical data, there might be something else that's happening, say, in the community, that we say, you know what, that's not the good fit. That's, we, we want to avoid that for one reason or another. But, but yes, we, it, both. And not to prevent everybody from drinking, but so on the off-peak days, you're essentially just saying, all right, we're, we're kind of just going to, whatever happens on those dates just happens. If we get a couple hundred people, that's great. You're treating it almost as the cherry on top. Yeah, pr pretty much. There are, there are a couple of programs that are seasonally adjusted that probably most minor league teams do, things like school days, that type of thing, where we say, okay, we're going we're gonna to invest our energies in that. However, we know that maybe one of those three days or two of those three days are going to be sell out, but the third one's not going to be. It doesn't mean we're not going to put any energy on that, but it's very group-themed focus when we're going to do it. I've been there, I mean, this is my sixth season, and so we've, we've been doing it largely the whole time. So then, you know, seven years ago, mm -hmm. and that, like, have you seen any dip in total tickets sold out at the end of the year? Since at some games you, you're going to have a much lighter crowd, um, have you found that? We, we've actually gone up. We've actually gone up. Now, there has been a little bit of an adjustment when I say gone up. Um, there are some, some things we walked away from that have kind of maybe leveled it off so it's not as aggressive as you might like. So for instance, uh, has anyone heard the dreaded term buyout, you know, where, where you sell 3,000 tickets for like 500 bucks? Yeah, we had to pull the Band-Aid off on a couple of those, but if you were to adjust that for that, it's, it's, it's like that. So. You still do dollar man, right? That is the one thing that I have not gotten away from because they will lynch me if I take it from them. Yeah, I know, I know when I poured beer in your stadium, Mondays were great. Yeah, so, but, uh, but what we have done, when this thing started, he's talking about something that's a long-standing, eerie tradition called, called Buck Night. When they started it, and you guys can all shake your heads, 
when I say this because I shake my head when I, when I say it, um, which is that uh, they, they started a Monday promotion where they sold beer, hot dogs, popcorn, and soda pop, and tickets for a dollar each, and promptly lost a lot of money doing it, but still did it. Uh, it looks great, it looks fantastic. It looks great, but it also erodes the other days that you're trying to do something on. So, uh, so uh, we have gotten tickets up to full price. We have taken, uh, we have taken, uh, we've created another tier of beer where there's a $2 beer and that's a little smaller, so there's a little more margin, there's some things like that. We've adjusted that and pretty much at some point in the next two or three years there'll be renovations to the facility and when that happens, shh, that'll be the last one. So. We're gonna we're gonna sell we're gonna sell to the folks that I mean obviously you talk about the, the lottery type of thing just to be clear we actually don't implement that so just you know we we do we reach out to our customers and it is for us it's first come first serve however they also know what those peak dates are they know the way that we operate and they know that they need to get their stuff in early so it's the it's the person that comes around in May who's like well I'd like a Saturday night in July sorry so that's that's where it is so but the lottery is just like I said a strategy from another team. Okay, so from our standpoint, we, uh, we, we set a target of trying to sell 22, right? You know, so the idea for us is we're gonna sell, we're gonna target 22 with the idea that we're gonna sell 15. Now I'd love to sell 22, that'd be fantastic, but some things do get in the way of that. Uh, Mother Nature happens to be one of those things. So, so that's our focus as far as that. As far as groups, as soon as we have our schedule and we have our price structure for the following year, we wanna get after it. And so for us, I happen to have a schedule that's 90% done at this point. So we kind of know when we're gonna be home and we can trickle it out to our big accounts at this point. Um, but in terms, of, um, in, in terms of actually being able to go out there, you still have the pricing piece that needs to be done. So for us, it's largely gonna be late August. We'll do a deposit, we'll do a deposit. And then we, we settle up, you know, basically final numbers four weeks out, two weeks out, it's the, uh, uh, the balance. All right, guys, I think we got to wrap up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>